Hi, this video is a little different from the other videos in this VR4300 N64 series. While we are concerned with designing an efficient component for performing loads and stores for the VR4300 data path, the more relevant issue here is how to implement one in an elegant way. That problem is the main reason why there has been such a long delay between this and the previous video. Simple aligned load and stores are fairly straightforward. However, the MIPS3 architecture allows for unaligned load stores via the left-right instructions, which adds another level of complexity, as you will see later in this video. I should note that I don't anticipate resource usage or timing will be too much of an issue. To understand how the VR4300 performs loads and stores, we must first talk about endianness. To understand this, let's consider the simple case of a 32-bit word. Here the least significant bit is denoted by bit 0 on the right, and the most significant bit is denoted by bit 31 on the left. This way of describing the word is the binary representation of an integer number, where bit 0 represents 2 to the 0, bit 1 represents 2 to the 1, and so on. In this description, however, all memory blocks are aligned to bit 0, so an 8-bit number, or byte, would be bits 7 down to 0, and a half word would be bits 15 down to 0. The remaining values that make up the word, not occupied by the smaller memory units, would then be filled with either zeros or ones. While this would work as a method for addressing the computer memory, we can see that it is quite space inefficient if we are attempting to store a value smaller than a word. This is why most processors, including the VR4300, are byte addressable, meaning that they can typically load or store a single byte into memory and are also capable of manipulating larger chunks such as half words, words, and double words. This leads to a problem though. Notice how the 32-bit word can be represented by four bytes. Which byte is byte number zero? We need to choose either the left byte, which contains bit 31, or the right byte, which contains bit 0. Another way to pose this problem is whether or not the most significant byte should be byte 0 or byte 4. Both choices are valid ways of addressing memory, leading to the notion of big endian and little endian, respectively. Here is a diagram for the VR4300 datasheet, which describes the differences for a 64-bit double word. This is in contrast to the typical 32-bit diagram. Since the VR4300 is a 64-bit processor, we must consider how all of the addressable memory units map to byte addresses. And since a double word consists of 64 bits or 8 bytes, the double word addresses in this diagram increment by 8. The solution may seem apparent to choose the addresses representation that the VR4300 uses. However, therein lies the problem. The VR4300 can use either representation and is selectable based on a register value. Additionally, the VR4300 supports using different endianness for kernel and user permission levels. So that means that you could be running an operating system running in big endian, which then runs some user program using little endian. For context, here are some notable computer architectures and which endianness they supported. Note that the majority of architectures are by endian, but have a default endianness specified. I denoted the default in parentheses. The reason for the default endianness is that every by endian architecture selects this endianness based on a register value. That register value, however, needs to be set to something when the processor first powers on, otherwise it won't know how to make sense of the very first instruction it needs to execute. It should also be noted that most of these architectures, including the MIPS architecture, require that memory units be aligned with a zero address offset. That means that the very first double word, word, half word, or byte in memory will start at address zero and the second will be at address 0 plus the size in bytes. So the second double word will always be at address 8, and the second word will be at address 4, etc. With endianness out of the way, let's look at the load store instructions that the MIPS3 architecture defined. We have seven load instructions and their four store counterparts. These allow us to load and store bytes, half words, words, and double words. Additionally, since the processor is 64 bits, bytes, half words, and words all occupy less than the 64-bit data path, and therefore what to place in the remaining bits is ambiguous. That's why the architecture specifies regular and unsigned variants of the loads, where if the unsigned variant is specified, the remaining bits are set to zero. Otherwise, the bits are sign extended from the most significant bit of the loaded block. So if bit 31 of a word has a value of 1 and a load word instruction was executed, then bits 63 down to 32 would all contain the value 1. If on the other hand, load word unsigned was executed, then bits 63 down to 32 would be 0, regardless of the value of bit 31. The architecture also specifies two semaphore based load store commands. The load length instructions act like the regular load instructions with the additional feature that they set a special length bit in the processor to 1. The store conditional instructions, however, behave like the regular store instructions only if the 
linked bit has a value of 1. Otherwise, the store does not take place. Additionally, the source register is updated with the success or failure of the store being either a 1 or a 0, respectively. This bit is cleared upon returning from an exception or a cache invalidation and can be used to synchronize threads as well as multiple processors. And finally, there are four special alignment load and store instructions. These are the most problematic to implement because of how they modify memory and register contents and will be discussed in more detail later. Recall that in addition to implementing these instructions, they must also all be implemented for both big and little endian. Let's start with the simple load store instructions and see how they differ in big and little endian modes. To start off with, we have the trivial case of the double word instructions. The top row shows the byte ordering for the cache or bus side, and the bottom row shows the byte ordering within the processor. Note that for the processor, I am grouping the bytes as per the little endian order, where bits 7 down to 0 are in byte 0, bits 15 down to 8 are in byte 1, etc. I also added the bit ordering for the rightmost byte to show that the bits are not reversed. First. In the case of the double word, we simply need to map each byte to the corresponding byte on the memory data port, be it the bus or the cache. Additionally, we could implement the big or little endian swap by a simple mux, which selects one of the two byte ordering at the port. Next, we have the store word instructions. Here you can see that I duplicated bytes 3 down to 0 on the processor side. This can be accomplished by performing a shift left by 32, which is in fact what the VR4300 does internally. It utilizes the shift path of the execution unit to perform Form the store alignments. Additionally, notice that I drew arrows connecting all 8 bytes. This indicates that we can actually keep the same connections for the double word case and we can use bytewise write enable signals, which once again is exactly what the VR4300 does. So for example, writing to cache utilizes 8 write enable signals, one for each byte. The load word instruction, however, requires some additional hardware. Here we can either map the upper word or the lower word onto bit 31 down to 0 of the data path, obviously requiring a multiplexer to select the upper or lower word. Load and stored half word and byte are similar to the load store word instructions. Once again, utilizing the shifter and the byte write enable signals for stores and multiplexers or loads, there are two things we can note here. One, we need some form of a decoder to select the write enable flags for the stores. And two, we need variable input multiplexers for each byte in a load. So we don't need a multiplexer for the upper four bytes. We need a two input multiplexer for bytes three and two, four input for byte one, and an eight input for byte 0. We could alternatively add another shifter in the path, however that would require more hardware than a simple multiplexer. So far this doesn't seem too complicated, but recall that I said I would discuss the left and right instructions later. They add more complexity. Recall when I said that all loads and stores need to be aligned with an offset of 0. Well, the left-right loads and stores are a way to load and store unaligned memory. Luckily, the VR4300 datasheet provides us with a nice way to visualize this. These charts are a bit to take in, so let's go through them part by part. The first thing to note is that the stores will only affect memory and will not modify the register value. So we are only dealing with the store interface here. Next, we have three fields, Big Endian CPU, LEM, and BEM. The Big Endian CPU is a bit set in the status register when the CPU starts and can be set by the boot code. The LEM and BEM are Little Endian Memory and Big Endian Memory. These can only differ from the Big Endian CPU bit when running in user mode, which is the reverse endianness behavior that I had previously previously mentioned. So if big endian CPU equals 1 and the processor is running in kernel mode, then we would look at the BEM field. And finally, we have the V address bit 2 down to 0 field on the left column. Now we can start by highlighting the memory values that change. There are two things that I can immediately notice. The register value is shifted right by the BEM offset for the store double left instruction. Similarly, the register value is shifted left by the LEM offset of the store double instruction. And the stores can be done with the bytewise write enable signals. If we deal with chunks of 8 bytes at the cache and bus interface, then the offset itself is irrelevant, allowing for us to correlate the offset with the store shift amount. So on the surface, these instructions appear to be complicated, but are actually relatively simple. What about the case for the single word instructions? Here you can see that the result is almost identical, where the register value is shifted right by the offset for store word left, and shifted left by the offset for store word right. The only caveat here is that only the lower four bytes are written to memory, and the writes are word aligned. Notice how each store is only within the word IJKL or MNOP and never crosses the two. Once again, this can be accomplished with the bytewise write enable signals. 
so the stores ended up not being too bad. What about the loads? Unlike with the stores, the loads do modify the register value, and on top of that, they may keep a few of the bytes that are currently in the register. To visualize this, let's mark the bytes that are modified by the loads. Here you can see that this looks very similar to the stores. However, instead of shifting the register value, which is easy, we need to shift the memory value, which is not. With that said, the memory value could be sent back to the shifter to be used in the subsequent cycle. However, doing so poses the problem of recombination with the register file, i.e. how and where do we do the recombination. The simplest solution would be to use a logical OR after the shift. However, that would require an additional cycle on top of the additional two that is already needed. Another solution could be to have a simple logical OR built into the load aligner. However, that then poses the question of where the current register value comes from, i.e. there would be no available data path to be used. A final alternative would be to allow for bytewise write enable signals in the register file, which is something that would add complexity to the register file, something that I don't particularly want to do. With that said, the only remaining solution is to implement the full realignment and recombination within the aligner. However, before we decide to do that, let's briefly look at the single word load right and left cases and see if they differ. Here you can see that the left right word loads are a bit different than the word stores and double word loads. There are two added symbols to this table, s which represents the sign extended value and x which means to keep the same value as currently in the register. If you look closely, you can actually see a similarity to the load double word left right case, with the exception of chopping the triangle shaped modification in half. Here is what the shift would look like if the sign extension mask and the bytes were continued below the least significant bit. So, for the load word right case, we continue to shift the memory value to the right by the LEM value, and for the load word left case, we shift the memory value to the right by 4, and then to the left by the BEM value. Additionally, we need to apply some sort of mask to prevent some of the memory values from overwriting the register values. So what can we infer from all of these instructions? Well, we need to revisit the idea of using a shifter instead of using a multiplexer to allow for the left-right instructions. Additionally, the shifter only needs to shift bytes, but it does need to be able to shift left and right. From the previous slide, you may have noticed that the processor handles endianness based on a series of flags. There are three of them in total, big endian memory, reverse endian, and big endian CPU. The first two are bits within the system coprocessor zero registers, while the third is a function of the first two. According to the R4300's manual, these flags affect the memory behavior in two ways. First, the lower three bits of the address are reversed if the reverse endian bit is set, and second, the bytes are reversed if the big Endian CPU statement is true. We could take care of the byte swapping by simply flipping the way the bytes are loaded and stored by the load store unit using a simple 2 to 1 multiplexer. As for the address flipping, we could abstract that away into a non issue if we simply extend the system data bus to 64 bits instead of the original 32 bit bus of the R4300. If we do this, then the processor will both read and write blocks of 64 bits, which is the largest block of data the R4300's data path can access, resulting in the addressing scheme of the 8 bytes being irrelevant to the 64 bits being read or written. And all of this should be selectable by the BE CPU flag. So now that we have the endianness figured out, what would the entire load align unit implementation look like? Here's an idea for the implementation of the load store unit. There are a few key features here to take note of. For one, the RAM is drawn as a register, which it effectively behaves like one from the processor's point of view. However, it does not have the same timing requirements for the pipeline that a register would have. While reads are expected to propagate from the virtual address denoted by VADDR to the memory unit and out through the byte shifter to the write back register within a single clock cycle, a write is not expected to be available for reading in the subsequent cycle. The reason for this is that the memory unit contains a write back buffer which may take several cycles to update. So in a sense, think of the RAM block here as an asynchronous read with a write moved over to be in line with the DC write back register. Next, we have three inputs coming from the left, all of which come from the execution pipeline stage. The first is the store data, which exclusively comes from the ALU shifter. Next, we have the virtual address, which exclusively comes from the adder. And finally, we have the result data, which comes from all the ALU subunits. This means that both the adder and the shifter can be in use in the same cycle, and either result can be made available to the result data line. This allows for the virtual address calculation and store align to be performed 
performed at the same time, or a virtual address calculation and pass through for a load left right instruction. We also have a single output to the right, which is the right back buffer register for the right back pipeline stage. We also have our NDNS swap multiplexers at the input and output of the memory unit. These will select one of the two byte orders and will depend on bits set in the coprocessor zero register file. These will also be responsible for swapping the byte enable bits to follow their corresponding bytes. We have a byte wide shifter on the load align path. This is capable of performing left and right shifts by byte increments. And then the byte shifter feeds through a masking and recombination circuit, which is supported by a mask ROM. Here the mask ROM takes the lower bits of the virtual address along with the instruction information to produce a byte wide mask. It also produces the inverted copy of the mask which is sent to be masked with the resulting data. The final values are then recombined using an OR gate. Notice that the result data always go through this masking circuit which results in simpler hardware than using a mask circuit and a multiplexer. And finally we have the write enable ROM which is used to select the byte wise write enable signals for writing to memory. One thing that I wanted to mention is that the ROMs here are being used as lookup tables. This typically results in a faster FPGA implementation with fewer logic units than specifying behavioral or logic equations in the HDL. In fact, the mask ROM will most likely be composed of two sub-ROMs, one of which is just the inversion of the other. That will allow the synthesizer to duplicate the hardware for better placement and routing, as opposed to simply negating the output, which would require the signal to go through an additional logic unit. There is one thing that has not been implemented, however, and that's the load link store conditional behavior. We could actually implement that with an additional 1-bit register and the units we already have. If we are performing a load link, all we have to do is set the register bit. So that that falls on the control logic. Now for the store conditional, we want to store if the link bit is 1, which also falls on the control logic, which can simply and the write enable mask with the link bit. We also want to put the result back into the original register, being either 0 if the link bit is 0, or 1 if the link bit is 1. So we can simply select the ROM mask that prevents anything from passing through, and then or the 0th bit with the link bit. We would also need to mask the link bit within the control signal to prevent stuck at 1 error. But that just means that bits 63 down to 1 have a 2 input OR gate at the end, and bit 0 has a 3 input OR gate. We can also add an additional mask step before the write back register to perform all of the required sign extension, which is not shown. This can be done via another set of mask ROMs, one to pick out the sign bit, and the other to select which bits be extended. For example, a load word instruction would check bit 31 to see the sign extension should be 0 or 1, and the mask ROM would select bits 63 down to 32 to be the extended bits. And with that, we are able to implement all 23 load and store instructions. Now obviously the next step is to look at the synthesis results. As with the previous videos, I will be comparing the synthesis results based on the Altera Cyclone 5 C7 speed device and the Xilinx Arctic 7-1 speed device, both of which are readily available in development kits. Also, as with before, the implementation is sandwiched between two register sets for the I.O., which should produce an estimate of the maximum clock frequency obtainable. With that said, let's see how the synthesis did. I only have one synthesis attempt here since it does a good enough job that I don't think it's worth trying to optimize further. Both the slowest clocks are above that of the N64's 94 MHz VR 4300, and both fast clocks are above the PS2's 295 MHz. Note that the load align unit does not use any flip flops, all of which are used by the IO registers. Interestingly, the Cyclone 5 uses fewer logic units. I also implemented the instruction paths version of the load aligner, which only needs to perform the load word operation. As as it turns out, this reduces to two multiplexers, one for the reversing of the endianness and another to select either the upper or lower word from the 64-bit double word. Since both FPGAs use multi-input logic units, multi here being more than four, the two multiplexers can be implemented as a single logic unit for each bit, which is why the usage is around 32 for both the Cyclone 5 and the Arctic 7. The slight difference comes in how each device defines a single logic unit. And that's pretty much it. After all that work, the result is a little underwhelming. However, the design is synthesizable with decent performance and produces the correct result as I understand it, which is the ideal outcome. Hopefully you found this interesting. Thanks for watching.